Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just another minute or so. <clears throat> Taking the time to settle in, check and see what the body needs to feel relatively upright in our posture, relatively relaxed, relatively still. And as you know, we usually begin by chanting the three refuges. And we do that in Pali and most of you know it by now. So just follow along, appreciating this time to sing together, even though on Zoom, of course, we don't hear each other. And um, just so you know, I did spotlight myself. It just makes the recording a little bit easier for the volunteers that uh, organize our live stream. So if you want gallery view, you can just click that in the upper right. Settling into our posture for the meditation time. I'll begin just reading a paragraph from Bhikkhu Bodhi, this Western monk, talking about the impermanence of feeling tongue. Awareness is kept at the level of bare attention one watches each feeling that arises, seeing it as merely a feeling, a bare mental event shorn of all subjective references, all pointers to an ego. The task is simply to note the feeling's quality, its tone of pleasure, pain, or neutrality. But as the practice advances, one goes on noting each feeling, letting it go and noting the next. The focus of attention shifts from the qualities of feelings to the process of feeling itself. 
the process reveals a ceaseless flux of feelings arising and dissolving, succeeding one another without halt, without a halt. Within the process, there is nothing lasting. Feeling itself is only a stream of events, occasions of feeling, flashing into being moment by moment, dissolving as soon as they arise. Thus begins the insight into impermanence, which as it evolves, overturns the three unwholesome roots. There is no greed for pleasant feelings, no aversion for painful feelings, and no delusion over neutral feelings. All are seen as merely fleeting and substanceless events devoid of any true enjoyment or basis for involvement. So beginning as we have many times during the course, being present with this great ocean of bodily sensation. And just do your best to soften in a sense to drop into the experience of sensation, this ocean of sensation, the sitting body. As if for the first time, curious about the very nature of sensation and in particular, not so much the specific qualities of a particular sensation, but the activity, the flow, the movement of bodily sensations coming and going. During the waking day, so much of this flow of sensation is simply overlooked. It's just too neutral, these sensations, most of the sensations to be worthy of attention or any reaction. But now we're choosing to be pleasant, present, and some of the sensations that are coming and going will be experienced as pleasant and possibly some, probably some will be experienced as unpleasant. And as I mentioned, many, many will be relatively neutral. Breathing in, simply experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing sensitive to the whole body. And we know from our study that being a human being, being sensitive in these six ways, sensitive to all the mental activity and sensitive through the five senses, the five physical senses of hearing and seeing, smelling and tasting and touching. So there is this impingement, this endless contact, endless experiencing through these six ways, these six sense gates, as we call them in Buddhism. And really this is our essential 
human experience, this endless impingement, endless flow of contact, of sight, of thought, of sound, of touch, smells and tastes. So with our meditative training, we can get better at the awareness staying closer to this place of contact. Seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing, being known. Touching is just touches being known. Thinking is just thought being known, smelling, tasting, just that being known. And to the degree that we're more at this bare attention to the sense gates, we can realize how the mind doesn't need to be dependent on any conceptual meaning. We don't need a story that explains our experience to ourselves. We can be in the immediacy of this contact, <clears throat> this experiencing. And this generally works relatively well until some of that flow of contact is perceived as being very pleasant or very unpleasant. And with that stronger feeling tone of pleasantness or unpleasantness, and for tonight we'll talk more about the unpleasantness, those experiences. There's that strong push, strong seeming need for a story. This isn't fair, this is too much. So then the practice is to stay right at the level of contact, perception, feeling, tone, and to keep realizing moment by moment that I don't, the mind, the heart doesn't require a story. And whenever it flows inward toward a story, it always gets tight. It's the second arrow or the second dart that unnecessary suffering. So we're going to continue sitting in silence now. And you can just as your working ground, just breathing in, experiencing, opening to the whole body, breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And whether the pleasantness or unpleasantness is in terms of sensation or other thoughts and emotions that might show up. We're just seeing if we can do our best to stay in the immediacy of sense contact, perception and feeling tone. There's no way to stop that river of experiencing. But in a way, we're going to learn how to digest, how to open, how to soften, how to allow. 
And then if things get intense for whatever reason, and we're not able to stay at that immediacy of sense experience and the perception and feeling tone that comes with it, then just ask yourself, well, what here in the present moment can I be aware of? Maybe I can't, don't have enough stability of awareness to be with what's predominant. Maybe I can open to hearing, even though it's not the predominant experience. And I can be with the hearing and the perception of hearing and any feeling tone. So let's continue now in silence for a while.
And if at any time there's a sense of being trapped by unpleasant experience, then you can simply remind yourself that the Buddha taught that feeling is impermanent. It arises and it changes. Just see if that lightens the oppressiveness of unpleasant feeling tone, knowing that it's in the process of change already. It never really was a static, permanent thing. And it never really refers back to anybody. It's just something arising due to causes and conditions coming out of the past, really. And is already in the process of changing. And again, remember if there's not much stability of present moment awareness, or if the unpleasantness is very intense, then the mind is likely to get in a defensive stance, which never really works. At best, we just tolerate the pain, but the body and mind is tight and we're reinforcing the habit of being tight. So that's the time to ask ourselves, what else can I pay attention to? And to strategically turn the attention away from the pain, even if it's strongly predominant. You can even if needed, open your eyes, be aware of seeing, be aware of hearing, You can pretty much do whatever you need to do to stay in the present moment in a balanced way. And this permission is especially important at times in our lives where there's a lot of unpleasantness showing up to give ourselves permission to do whatever we have to do so that we're able to be aware, we're able to be present without resorting to reactivity and aversion and hate and denial and distraction, none of which really helps in the long run.
So the freedom that the Buddha points to isn't the freedom that we can temporarily experience when the feeling is really nice or really neutral. The freedom that the Buddha points to is realizing the heart that knows how to be with whatever feelings come our way. Knows how to be with pain, knows how to be with pleasure, knows how to be with neutrality without adding tension, without generating a heavy story about the particular feeling, without the conceit that I have pain or I have pleasure or nothing's happening, it's all neutral. And this week, especially having studied the unpleasant end of sensation and thought, painful Vedana. Just revisioning, imagining what would it be like to live my life with a more open, less, less fixed idea of what pain is. Whatever story we tell ourselves about pain, that's never actually the experience. We don't need a story. We don't need the story pain is bad. Pain is just what it is. So for the last minute or so, if there is some place now in the body or some emotion, some thought that's unpleasant now, allow it to be the object of awareness. Notice the contact and the perception of the experience and the feeling tone in a fresh way. Oh, it's just this. And this is quite alive with change, with movement. Does it have to be framed or understood as a personal problem? Can it just be what it is? Feeling being known. Nice to be with everybody tonight. Really appreciate everybody sticking with the course, even though we're not able to be in the room together and uh, likely we're not, um, we're always gonna be including probably our online community even when we're through the COVID crisis. But even though uh, we're not in the room together, it really matters just showing up. It's not just hopefully good for us individually, but it's good for the, the whole of the group that we stick with it, do our best to practice and learn and to join in for the small groups every other week, which is tonight. And I know that for some of you that feels like a stretch, it might even be late for some of you, but if it can work for you, please stay until nine o'clock central time and 
join in for those last 15 or 20 minutes for the small group discussion. It can be a really rich part of the practice. And as I mentioned last week, in the small groups tonight or in your conversations with your Dharma friends in the days ahead, to have a sincere, lively conversation about how the mind relates to unpleasantness, whether the unpleasantness is based in the mind like a painful memory or thought, or the unpleasantness is based in the body through one of the five senses, as an irritating sound, a painful sight, a painful touch, etc. I want to start by reading a little bit from um, Tanisara's uh, book that she wrote with her partner, Kitasaro. Uh, I think uh, Shelley Graff has been using this book on Wednesday evening for a while now, um, Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engage Buddhism by Kitasaro and Tanisa, Tanisara. Tanisara, I think is actually how she pronounces it. Um, and they're two former monastics that took their monks and nuns robes off and got married and are kind of a dynamic duo Dharma teachers. They have a retreat center in South Africa, but they teach around the world in the West mostly. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so let me read a little bit. And it's really about being, you know, learning to be real. You know, we're not trying to be special <laughs> with our feelings. We're just trying to be real, like we're a sensitive human being and we're trying to wake up in a real sense to this part of what it means to be human that we have feeling tone. And remember, feeling tone is just an information system. It's how the past speaks to the present because where does the particular feeling that you're having right now the flavor of your experience, the effective flavor of your present moment experience? How is it that the heart generates a feeling? What is that? What is it generating it out of? It's past impressions. That's why you and I could have the same outer experience, but it could be a very painful experience for me and pleasurable for you because the way your past has conditioned the mind, you generate this current experience as pleasure and I'll generate it as unpleasant. So it's an information system that we feel pleasantness, that we feel neutrality, that we feel pain. And we can just hold it in that way. Okay, this is being understood as, as painful. This is being understood as pleasurable. This is being this is understood as neutral, neither clearly pleasant nor clearly unpleasant. Okay. We don't have to do more. So here's what uh, Tanisara wrote. In our contemporary society, when we feel disenchanted, it's seen as a problem. We are encouraged to go shopping, take medication or find some other escape. We think if I sit on the beach today, I'll be much happier than staying here. So we go to the beach. We're happy for a few minutes. And then we think, if I just had a nice coffee, I'd feel better. Or we think, it's too hot here. I'll go up to the mountains where it's cooler. I'd be happy. This seeking drives us on and on. It's a good sign when we begin to be suspicious of endless pursuit. It means we're not buying into it so much. Periods of retreat bring us into direct confrontation with what we've been trying desperately to avoid, this basic feeling of dissatisfaction. This isn't to say that things like antidepressants and holidays don't have their place, but even when we get life as perfect as we can, the underlying message of dukkha, which is this unsatisfactoriness, if you don't know that word, still crashes in it prods us until we respond to the invitation to contemplate our experience more carefully. Sometimes when we acknowledge the presence of suffering, we immediately want a solution, fix it quick, get a Band-Aid, take it away. This is a nice thing. No, this is me, not Tanisra. It's a nice thing about using the form of 
sitting meditation where we sit still as best we can for a set period of time that we've decided. Because then when we have an itch, when we have a tickle, when we have that, you know, wiry restlessness or that sleepiness and we just want to collapse, we get interested because we decided we're sitting for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. And so there's really no option because <laughs> we've decided we made that resolve. That's the whole point of the meditation form of sitting up relatively relaxed, relatively still for a period of time that we've chosen. It really becomes a very powerful training ground for observing the mind precisely because we're not doing what we do all day long, which is this endless pursuit that Tanisra is talking about. There's one more paragraph I want to read here. This, this is kind and careful work. When, we, when circumstances generate pain or anguish, we can lessen dukkha by patiently containing our reactivity. Then, at the place of suffering, the journey of transformation opens up as beautifully articulated in Mark Nepo's poem. We become, quote, a soft and sturdy home in which real things can land, unquote. This describes perfectly the quality of awareness and receptivity needed to undertake the journey through suffering. We no longer try to make sense of the pain. This is so important that we don't need a story about whatever the feeling tone is. Like we, this is so cool. Like when you're feeling a lot of joy, you know, notice you got to talk about it, but when you get, you know, you're having a really nice experience, just get close to the pleasantness of it. A lot of times we talk to whoever's around us when there's a lot of pleasantness, because we don't know how to be intimate with pleasantness. And of course, the same is true with pain. We no longer try to make sense of pain. We create a space and allow awareness to provide a gentle holding for the irritations that rub to a pearl. This is the work of vipassana, which just means insight. As we inquire into the moment, dukkha becomes dharma or nature rather than me, right? And I love that. Suffering, pain becomes nature, becomes dharma, becomes the working ground of awakening. And that's not just like a, a story, that's an insight we can have. Because one way or the other, there's going to be a lot of pain being a human being. So either with conceit, pain is just a problem. And when, it was, and when we have misfortune and we have a lot of pain, then it can feel like a real betrayal, like somebody's out to get me. But we don't have to frame pain that way. I know it sounds a little, you know, especially to somebody who's got a, a lot of difficulty in their life, cancer or poverty or being oppressed in some way, taken advantage of in some way. And to tell them, hey, did you know that pain is the ground of awakening? You know, <laughs> they're not going to like you saying that to them, of course. But it's for us, each of us to check out, especially around the edges where the pain isn't overwhelming. Like I mentioned in the guided sit, when pain is overwhelming, much of the time when pain is overwhelming, if we can, the appropriate skillful response is to basically ask, what else can I pay attention to? <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know how to really be with this in a balanced way. So if I keep opening to this painful experience here in the moment, I'm just going to be reinforcing the tendency toward aversion and fear and being tight. So what else in this present moment can I turn to and be aware of? So if we're in a set and we want to stick with our sitting still, then maybe we even open our eyes or work with hearing. And even, you know, sometimes 
when it's really intense and we need to break that spell. You know, we almost like the habit is we get in a staring con contest with our pain. And it's sort of like, you know, who's going to blink first? And we're looking at it. But remember, that's, you know, I'm sure many of you realize this. It is not often skillful. I mean, at best, we're going to learn to tolerate pain. But that's, that's a pretty limited skill to have. I mean, it's not a worthless skill. Sometimes we want to be able to tolerate pain, you know, just sort of grit our teeth and bear it. But that's not spiritual practice, right? It's not really worthy of the work we're trying to do in our Dharma practice. So, and, and the thing about Dharma practice, it always relies, the real, the deeper learning always relies on balance. And so if we're overwhelmed by difficulty, then get some space, whatever, creatively, whatever you have to do to get some space from the difficulty to rediscover a balanced way of being in the present moment. That's why I love this about, you know, the Buddhist teachings, it's so pragmatic. And so these days, you know, where we have technology like antidepressants, for example, or any number of other means to help us through difficulty, not that we want to become overly reliant on these supports, but being in a defensive or reactive mode really gets in the way of learning and the deeper insights. So a lot of what we have to do when life is overwhelming is we have to get really creative and skillful at finding safety and comfort and soothing the heart and taking care of the body, clearing the mind, whatever works so that we're sort of living for another day, okay? I can't really be with the scary monsters in my life. So I'm gonna go take a walk around the block because I can be with that. I can be with the walking. I can be with the waving to my neighbors. You know, I can practice embodying, showing up, being with the relative neutrality and maybe even some of the pleasantness that might arise in that. And then I discover, I rediscover, oh, look at the uh, mind, the heart is being intimate with the conditions of the present moment with a lot of balance, not too much aversion, not too much greed, not too much distractedness. Oh, this is what balance feels like, right? And so then when inevitably difficulty or whatever shows back up, we can begin to relate to it from that place of balance until we can't. And then we creatively find a way to reset uh, and rediscover that balance. Let me finish reading these last few sentences. So I think I ended with, <clears throat> this is the work of Vipassana. As we inquire into the moment, Dukkha becomes Dharma or nature rather than me. That is a, uh, rather than me, that is wrong or bad. As we listen more deeply to suffering, we begin to notice non-suffering. The heart realizes its innate courage, strength, and invincibility. This journey through pain and suffering burns away the impurities. And what is revealed is something pristine, clear, and beautiful like a moonlit pearl, the tender, merciful heart and its infinite ability to receive the cries of the world. When we're with suffering, it's as if we're with a child that's very unhappy. If the child is wailing and wiggling, wanting to get away, wanting something, but it doesn't know what, we kindly hold the child. Sometimes we can experience our minds as the child and the awareness as the mother. The child of the mind can be really hurting and screaming. I can't bear this, I'm hopeless, or no one is there for me, or just an unnameable pain that seems so familiar, so ancient and intractable. But the mother, our aware present heart, just sits it out and waits patiently for the deeper truth to emerge. 
right? This is so important about patience. Patience is a, yeah, it's, it's a real superpower in Buddhist practice. And it isn't this sort of passive tolerance of what is unbearable because I don't know what else to do. That sounds a lot more like depression and despair. But patience is an enlivened quality like, uh, I don't know much, but I know things were changed. And I don't know much, but I know there's more here than I'm currently recognizing or understanding. This, like we often think of humility as like, I'm stupid, so I'm humble. <laughs> but humility is like, that means we're in the game. Because when we think we know, we're deluded. <laughs> But when we know we don't know humility, then that's the place for real insight and tasting this freedom that Tanisara is pointing to in her, uh, in these paragraphs. So just ending here, she writes, she is breathing with the pain while gently holding the mind and body with kind awareness. Then something happens, something beyond the reactivity of the mind. Instead, of the, instead, the heart softens. It sees its own nature, spacious, non-suffering, peaceful, timeless. Here is freedom. Here we find the courage to bear suffering in order to, uh, in order to overcome it. And then she, at the end of this uh, article, she quotes Helen Keller, this famous quote you probably have heard, all the world is full of suffering it is also full of overcoming suffering. Some of you long time common ground folks remember in the basement at the old center, which we had from 1993 to 2008 in the bathroom, in the one bathroom we had in the old center, we had that quote from Helen Keller for all those years. And here's something that came from uh, Kathy Lynn Solomon, one of our uh, uh, community members, a beautiful poem they wrote recently. And Kathy Lynn is uh, just working with a lot of difficulty, including a serious health crisis. Um, and she wrote this, I think, beautiful poem that has a lot of wisdom in it that I thought I'd share. And the title is, Yes, But No. You suggest that I say yes to this illness, but I won't keep it. I say yes to this illness, but not that it's mine. It's not my illness. I don't and won't own it. Okay, so I say yes to my illness, but what if that gives it permission to grow? I, I say yes to dying, but not yet, not yet. I say yes to losing all my dreams, it hurts. You told me there is a freedom of the heart I might experience saying yes, rather than saying no to all of it so tight in there. I don't know how to say yes in my heart, so I try this, yes to the mold in the house, yes to the dying car, Yes to the basement flooding. Yes to the chaos. Yes to the money stress. Yes to betrayal, the pain, the bitterness, the ache of loss. Yes to friends who moved far away this year. Yes to my three living sisters not being part of my life. Yes to not in this life, having a soulmate singer, someone who loves spirit as much as me, someone who I get to love too. Yes to the ambiguities never resolved, the uncertainty. Yes to goodbye dance, mountain climbs, work, play, all of that. Yes to all the complications and layers of my life, a tapestry I cannot begin to fathom. Yes to what I will never understand. I counseled my clients that to heal, we must accept what is right now in the present moment. 
so much easier to advise than to live it myself. And the spring rains fall, heedless of the 21-year-old boy man who murdered 10 people, heedless of my pain, heedless of all those things except the running of the waters on the earth, bubbling up and unfurling life with every drop. Yes, to that keen glory, the surprise like a child for the first time, feeling mud in toes and under soles of feet. Yes, to the tapestry of who is, who is this me so different each time I took, each time I look at my life when I allow, yes. Isn't that beautiful? That's what we call being interested in dukkha, being interested in pain, just to be able to contemplate, to keep the heart open. Because the, you know, part of the way we think we can protect ourselves, it's actually the second arrow, is we tell ourselves a story about pain that ends up adding to the weight of the unavoidable pain, unavoidable, unavoidable difficulties that come our way. Take a look at that article by David White that I sent a couple of weeks ago, if you haven't yet, Solace. And it's just a one page document. Um, he's a wonderful poet, if you don't know David White. I'll just read a little here. Solace, you know, the, I don't know if you know that word, to give comfort to, to allay, to soothe in, um, someone's grief and misfortune. Fortune. And in that article, he writes, solace is not an evasion, nor a cure for our suffering, nor a made up state of mind. Solace is a direct scene and participation, a celebration of the beautiful coming and going, appearance and disappearance of which we have always been a part. Solace is not meant to be an answer, but an invitation through the door of pain and difficulty to the depths of suffering and the simultaneous beauty in the world that the strategic mind by itself cannot grasp nor make sense of. To look for solace is to learn to ask fiercer and more exquisitely pointed questions, questions that reshape our identities and our bodies and our relation to others. Standing in loss, but not overwhelmed by it, we become useful and generous and compassionate and even more amusing companions for others. But solace also asks us very direct and forceful questions. Firstly, how will you bear the inevitable loss that will accompany you? And how will you endure it through the years? And above all, how will you shape a life equal to and as beautiful and as astonishing as a world that can birth you, bring you into the light, and then just as you were beginning to understand it, take you away. And of course, this is the mystery. And this is, this is the compelling evidence for me at least, you know, around how we relate to feeling, the pleasant, the unpleasant, the neutral, just the effective feeling of being a human being. The thing that's so compelling for me is it's like whatever we tell ourselves about the feeling we're feeling right now, it never helps the story. It seems, it always seems like coming up with some story, some, you know, explanation, defining what's going on for me or defining what's going on in the world. You know, just like this recent example with the recent shooting up in Brooklyn Center yesterday afternoon. I don't know what that uh, activates in your heart, but I'm sure for a lot of it, uh, for a lot of us rather, <clears throat> there's a lot of pain and maybe humiliation like, oh my God, this is my world. This is the community I live in, and maybe helplessness, maybe all kinds of different feelings. And, uh, and, you know, if you're like me, you know, and we're interested in feeling tone, 
then you might have noticed how many attempts today we try to tell ourselves a story about what's going on, about what we're feeling. And how hard it is just to feel that more raw, yucky feeling, whatever we might call it. Because in a way, a lot of what feeling points to is that <clears throat> this truth of uncertainty and unreliability and ungovernableness. Because we're totally, you know, being a sensitive human being we are unavoidably sensitive to sense contact and sense contact is going to generate, it's going to trigger feeling. We're exposed. And we need that exposure. It's like to sort of imagine being a human being <clears throat> not exposed is not being a human being. So the, the spiritual, the relevant spiritual question is, saying yes to the exposure, yes to the enormity and subtlety of feeling, but not confused by it, not imagining that feeling is something that it's not. And that's basically what we've been doing these, you know, it will be seven weeks next Monday, our last class. We're trying to have a more real, honest relationship to feeling without the deep habit of trying to make it into something that's always a conceit. It's always about me, a sense of a me, an I, a mine. But can we keep it more simple than that? Just feeling is what it is in that moment. It feels like this. So like I've been mentioning these last weeks, if we can get in that habit, what's the underlying feeling here? Oh, it feels like this. Okay. Now I'm, I'm back on earth. I'm back in a real relationship with the moment because I know the wisdom in a sense knows it feels like this now. And so now I'm in the vicinity of being skillful. Like, can I stay in this dynamic experience of feeling, feeling tone? Can I stay in this dynamic experience of feeling tone in a balanced way without acting on the push into some psychological, emotional reaction, like telling myself a story, because I don't yet know how to stay balanced with feeling, the exposure to this river, right? This never ending river of feeling. Uh, when I was in high school, we, there was a river that flowed by the school and I was a runner <clears throat> for all my high school years. And sometimes after practice in the afternoon, when it was warm, we'd go to the river and um, it was just the right kind of river, you know, where you could stand in the middle and it was in places at least about, you know, chest high. And, but it, it moved, it was a moving, you know, pretty fast flowing river. And so it was just interesting, like how much strength, sometimes you'd, you'd stand there and you felt like a kind of war between you and the current. You know, and you dig your feet in and you'd really lean in. But it's there's other sort of stories you can tell yourself about that river, which is the water knows how to flow around the body. And if you keep that in mind, you know, it's the same experience, but it's a different story about the sort of river of feeling. And so like when our story about the river of feeling stars a sense of me, you know, has a strong sense of conceit, then, then it's like we're at war with feeling. We're at war with neutrality because it's not important. We're at war with pleasant because you're strategizing how to hold on to it and get more of it. And we're at war with pain because it feels like a threat. It doesn't seem fair. And all of life, because all of life comes every sense experience comes with feeling tone, it's sort of like this endless war. So that's, that's just an image you can use, like maybe it's okay that the, there's this flowing river of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, never ending, never ever gonna end. Maybe that's not a problem. Maybe I just, because you know, feeling the movement 
the fact that a feeling comes up, you and I don't do that. It just happens, as I mentioned, because of the past conditioning on the heart and the mind. That the mind understands this as pleasant or this as painful. I mean, some of this bodily stuff, you know, is, is wired in. Painful sensation, for example. But in any case, it's going to flow. And it's always on, you know, moving onward to whatever's next. Here's something from the Buddha. The title of this little piece is called The Bottomless Pit. When, oh, practitioners, an untaught worldling says that in the great ocean, there is a bottomless pit. They speak about something unreal, not factual. Right? There's not actually a bottomless pit in the ocean. The bottomless pit, oh practitioners, is rather a name for painful bodily feelings. When an untaught worldling is afflicted by painful bodily feelings, one worries and grieves, one laments, beats one's breast, weeps and is distraught. One is then said to be an untaught worldling who cannot withstand the bottomless pit and cannot gain a foothold in it. Now, interestingly, why do you think, why do we think the Buddha used that analogy of a bottomless pit for pain, painful feelings, painful bodily feelings? Because when we have chronic pain, physical pain, we get tight around it all the time. I mean, it's the same with emotional pain. And then we like, that's the second arrow, but it keeps going. It keeps building, you know, our fear, our need to distract yourself. All of that is more stress on top of stress, pain on top of pain. And then fortunately goes on, you know, we left off with one cannot withstand the bottomless pit and cannot gain a foothold in it. Right, it's like a tumbling. These are the cycles of samsara you probably have heard. But it goes on, but when a well-taught noble disciple, somebody who's had some insight, is afflicted by painful bodily feelings, one will not worry or grieve or lament. One will not beat one's breast and weep, nor will one be distraught. One is then said to be a noble disciple who can withstand the bottomless pit and has gained a foothold in it. And the foothold again is just this capacity to be present with pain, not to be confused by it. So, um, you know, we're gonna have our small groups in a few minutes and I thought, you know, the um, obvious thing to talk about is just what have you been learning? Where is their pain, mental pain, physical pain? And what have you learned is unproductive in terms of how you're relating to it, how you're practicing with it? And what have you learned has been quite productive with relating to pain? And the, the thing that um, that you might really look at is how, when, you know, part of the, an interesting question for us practitioners is, you know, when we talk about how feeling tone can, uh, it, it combines with what in Buddhism we call wrong view, conceit, self-centeredness, right? And that's the combination of pain, let's say, and wrong view, self-centered thinking, self-centered framing of our experience, then the, the reaction of aversion is unavoidable because that's how the self-centered frame, that's what it does with painful experience. It gets tight with aversion and strikes out or tries to get rid of it or turn away from it. So it's it, one thing that's interesting to share in your groups is when you have a lot of pain, emotional or physical or mental, just to talk about how easy it is for the mind to understand it 
has some sort of personal affront. It's like so compelling for us to tell a story because it, this is the interesting thing about feeling tone. It's like the raw evidence for self. Of course I'm here because I'm feeling so good or I'm feeling so bad. And so that, that's a very deep connection where the deep habit where the mind has been in the habit, the, uh, the um, tendency to frame experience from a self-centered point of view is in the habit of using strong feeling tone to prove that the self view is the correct view. And it's like this tautology, you know, where because there's a strong feeling, there's a self, but because there's a self, feeling appears the way that it appears. Pain appears personally painful because of the self view. So they kind of fuel each other. The wrong understanding of pain fuels self-centeredness. Self-centeredness fuels the wrong understanding of pain and pleasure too and neutrality. So that can be a really interesting thing to unpack in the small groups tonight or just generally in your own contemplation. That relationship between selfing and the habitual way that we relate with pain. So before we end, I just want to make a couple of announcements. And I still have the questions that people sent in. And I hope to get to them next week um, for our last class. And we'll also be talking about neutrality in the large group next week. So please get interested in neutrality this week so that we have some things we can talk about together. And if you have questions or your own experiences about neutrality, feel free if you have some time to write it down, send it in. And I'll share some of those with the group next week. So don't be shy to share your experiences around neutrality. And uh, just to mention, we're gonna have a masculinity community conversation as we've been doing twice a year now for several years. Myself, Louis Alameyu, Omkar, Malik Watkins, Gabe Keller Flores, Rob Reed. I think that might be it but we've been facilitating these conversations for anybody who identifies as male or masculine and just how to be a skillful human being when we have this conditioning as a male or masculine um, in terms of our Dharma practice. So that's two o'clock on Saturday. Please join in if you're interested. Um, Tuesday nights is the Truth and Justice Vigil, six to 7.30. Shaila Catherine, a wonderful teacher, is gonna be speaking next Tuesday night at 7.30 about jhana practice, concentration practice. She has an old friend. Um, I'm gonna be teaching for her group in San Jose and she'll be teaching for Common Ground next Tuesday, not tomorrow, but the next Tuesday, um, the 21st. Great, so hope to see you all next Monday night and please stay on if you're able to stay for the small groups and I'll divide you into groups of four tonight in just a moment.